if you catch the vitamin D3, K2 deficiency before the kids are too far grown, you can affect the entire growth of their jaw and that is the growth of their airway because the, the, the palate is the base of the, the nose. So you need, for nasal breathing, you wanna have a wide palate, right? So if you can catch these kids before they go through their growth, then you can prevent massive craniofacial anomalies Kind of like me, we're not showing a profile of me, but I suffered from the syndrome profoundly as a kid. My mandible is underdeveloped, why? Mouth breathing, not enough calcium, not enough vitamin D with vitamin K2. When you don't have that calcium coming into the body, you will not get a full and proper jaw growth to occur. In fact, I never got second molar, so I only have a first molar. There was so little calcium in my development that it didn't have room to, for my jaw to grow. So as a dentist, as a clinician with a background in pediatrics, this is the subject that I really want to get out there because you can change the trajectory of your child's life by understanding what I call the foundational four, vitamin D3, vitamin K2, magnesium, and sulfur. And these, I think, are the, the deficiency of these four things are at the heart of 80% of the illness that we see today, and they go together, including heart disease, including autoimmune disease, including sleep disorders, and people are really losing their sleep. So when I got into this, to get people to admit they're not sleeping right, it's very hard, because everyone's very protective. They, they all want to say, oh no, I sleep great, like they're embarrassed. And it's when I started asking people about their vitamin D, they'd be like, oh, my, div my vitamin D level is just fine, thank you very much, I drink milk, or, you know, they get very defensive, and I was just more curious, I wanted to know, do you know what vitamin D is? So I started sup giving my, all my patients a supplementation sheet of what to take and how to take it, because I really want this information to get out there. When I had my very first 23-year-old petite female patient who came with dark circles under her eyes and said, and she said, I don't know what's wrong with me. We did a sleep study and she had terrible apnea. Went against everything that I was learning in my dental programs, what they're teaching. In general, dentistry is just saying sleep apnea, make a mouthpiece, wear a CPAP, it's your fault. You don't care about yourself, you're fat, you have a big neck, whatever, silly stuff. So almost all the kids I see are affected by this to some degree. The standard of care in my community is I refer all children to the orthodontist at age six to eight for an airway assessment. And I work with some really great people. Um, so it's something that I'm aware of, but the, um, what I wanna really bring to the forefront is the symptoms. So if anyone's listening to this and your child grinds their teeth, this is the primary and most obvious sign that your child is choking in their sleep. That bruxism doesn't just happen in the teeth, it's happening from the brain, the autonomic nervous system, and that's where the syndrome comes from. So symptoms to look for on your kids is clenching and grinding, really loud at night, snoring, um, poor behavior, ADHD, nocturia, wetting the bed. If your kids are wetting the bed, root cause, low vitamin D, root cause. And the crazy part about the sleep apnea syndrome is that it's also a craniofacial growth and development issue. And that's where they come together. I was doing labs on my patients, really getting into this. The normal range of vitamin D was 30 to 100. And of course that makes sense. By the end of the winter, you're down to 30. By the end of the summer, you're up to 100. If you spend time outside and are careful with, or don't wear sunscreen, and then one day they just switched it and it went from 20 to 50 with everything over 50 now labeled toxic. And my, so my patients who had levels of 60 who I was so happy with were coming and saying, well, my doctor says that I'm toxic and you're wrong. And I said to them, is that the same doctor that never tested your vitamin D? Did they recommend vitamin K2? I didn't really want to get into it, but I said to them, I'm going to show you, this is Kaiser. Kaiser kept 30 to 100. Why? Well, Kaiser loses money when you're sick. They have programs to keep you healthy. Traditional PPO medicine, they're the ones that changed it. And if you can provide me with a study that supports them shifting the whole normal value from 30 to 100 down from 20 to 50, I'd love to see that study. And you know that medical doctors, they're busy, they're doing the best they can, and they're gonna go through that. They're just gonna circle the, the areas where it's the, the level is not ideal. So we're really living in a kind of a weird time and place where my patients will go to their doctor and they have to decide, do I listen to my dentist or do I listen to my doctor? Yeah, that's a tough place to be. I mean, and that's why you being healthy and so you know, cognitively uh, astute and all that, I think is really helpful and, and so on. But you know, even when levels get over 100, I haven't seen serum calcium levels change. I think that's a primary concern, right? It's hyper hypercalcemia, but... Yeah. We don't see it. So I ha many of my patients have mistaken what I've told them. They've run, there's the highest level that we had with someone was over 200. They had zero symptoms. Their doctor freaked out 
And I told them, I said, stop taking it, don't ever take it again. And I said, you're good, We're, we'll get it back down. So I've never seen any symptoms. There are, I've never known there to be a death by vitamin D toxicity, but I know millions of deaths on vitamin D deficiency. I know how important this is. Vitamin D is one of the single most important hormones that's in our body. Yeah, and I think it's important to acknowledge that uh, supplementation I think in this case is really warranted because so many people are scared of the sun. You know, they say, oh, I go outside, but like, like you mentioned, you know, it's either in the morning or evening time where there's no sunlight, or they're lathering up or covering up because they're scared they're gonna get wrinkles or whatever else. Yeah. They're being good patients. Their doctors are telling this. I play beach volleyball and I'm known, they think I'm nuts because they all get out there, they spray themselves. And I'm like, guys, it, you know, I know that, that you know, it seems like you're protecting yourself, but you have to understand, first of all, that's a nanoparticle sunscreen. I say, this is what I try and say, if you wouldn't drink it, don't put it on your skin. So I would use beef tallow and coconut oil because those are the two things that I would happily drink. Those are the things that I use on my skin. When I have to be in the sun and I can't do anything, I will use a zinc oxide, non-nanoparticle, I don't care how white it makes me look. But other than that, I do not like to wear sunscreen. I want to get all my vitamin D naturally because you know there's so much more that you make in sunlight. One of the biggest things in recent study is, is melatonin. Subcellular melatonin depends on, on sun exposure during the day. So I try and tell my friends like, hey, just, you know, they're covered head to toe. Hey, take some of your stuff off. Hard in LA to see all the people who work outdoors completely covered up all the time because they're being warned. That's the message. My, my friend's six-year-old son was, a six -year -old, his six-year-old son was saying, I don't want to be in the sun, I need an umbrella. Mm -hmm. So the brainwashing is there. and. People can't go against their doctors, it makes sense, and they all say things like, my uncle has melanoma, so I have to be careful. Yeah, and it seems like that's on the rise, so everyone is spooked yeah. by those stories. Right, I and mean, you know that melanoma, if it were truly caused by excessive sun, we'd see melanoma on the nose, on the lower lip, on the ears, and on the head, we don't see that. You get a melanoma over here. Now, I know that you know who Jack Cruz is, mm -hmm. so he's now, interestingly enough, talking about melanin as a deuterium trap, which is interesting, so that, that's a little, little deeper in, but, the idea is that he, you know, if you stay out of the sun completely, that's a higher incidence of melanoma. People who work in the sun, they have a lower incidence. But definitely squamous cell carcinoma, basal cell carcinoma, those are the cancers. But they're new starting in the 80s when we started to use sunscreen. So that, in my opinion, and I've already had one removed. Mm -hmm. So um, I don't believe uh, in sunscreen anymore, but I did wear it for many years because I'm a traditional doctor and I listen to my doctors. Why would I want to put myself at risk? I can't blame anyone for being afraid of going in the sun or any of that. Mm -hmm. 